Hello and welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. Had a couple of questions on the YouTube channel and it's a Sunday afternoon. What better time to discuss one of my favorite topics and that is the silver market. So uh, just going to go through a brief overview uh, and particularly talk about uh, two uh, named miners in the silver area. So we're going to do general market commentary price action and expectations, where I think the silver price might be heading and what that might mean from an investment opportunity standpoint. Uh, Fortuna Silver Mines, que Oh man, uh, if you own Fortuna, uh, as I do, you would have uh, <laughs> awoken to the, the news. We're going to talk about that. Share price down 20% on the day. And then Patrick asks, can you do a video on First Majestic? Okay, so I'm going to time, uh, no, try and tie that in. And I just thought, all requests are backing up and I've got a lot of content uh, to do very busy as it is so I'm just going to try and time that in Patrick I hope that uh, hope that all uh, makes sense we're going to do a bit of a, a broad a broad spectrum overview and I'll compare uh, Fortuna and First Majestic so the silver market volatile okay you'll know that if you've been investing in the silver market for any length of time uh, i first started investing in the silver market uh, when was that start of 2020 okay so got in just at the right time uh, for the COVID sell-off and and started buying like most people just started buying physical bullion and then um, built out more of an understanding as to the the unit economics of the producers the difference between tier one producers developers explorers and and all that opened up a huge can of worms so it's my second or third favorite opportunity in the metal space okay so it, it probably was my first now i think that other opportunities uh have reversed themselves i used to be number one uh number one bullish on uranium and uh that uranium prices has run up and i've done very very well so i think now silver might be around the, the second or third and uh, so it's a tie at the moment between silver and copper it's a demand driven narrative though and that's what i don't like I like much less about silver. There is a far greater above ground supply when it comes to silver. So as the price starts to rise, you get that stored inventory come onto the market. Okay, so people have been stacking their bullion, they start to, or people that have fancy silverware, they start to, to sell that back onto the, the market. And then you have a, a supply flood and generally the, the price tends to come back down. Super volatile, seems to have this massive blow off tops uh, once every now and again. So if you're in, uh, if you're in it for the the right time, you can make a hell of a lot of money. But as opposed to copper and my take on the uranium market, which is more a supply driven market, this is a, a demand driven market. Questions out there around the silver squeeze, uh, this idea that the paper markets, the contracts for trading silver bullion, are, I think 250 times more contracts than there are actual physical. Uh, bullion for delivery so the idea was if you corner the market and buy up all the contracts and then demand physical delivery that would then start to cause a, a silver squeeze as all the uh, commodities traders that had sold short futures contracts would have to scurry to find physical metal in order to close uh, i don't think that will be the case uh, necessarily they might apply a little bit of pressure but ultimately i don't think it will be successful i think that the comex can change the rules and you can uh, the traders who had sold short, the large investment banks, will be able to settle for cash. And I think that will take quite a bit of steam out of the, the silver squeeze. As well as the, the fact of above ground inventories being a lot higher than, uh, for example, copper or uranium. But it is a very interesting market. Mean reversion play on the silver and gold ratio. So gold-silver ratio, uh, you know, how many ounces of silver it takes to buy gold is an interesting one to watch. When that gets out of whack, like it did in around March, April 2020, at, I think it was 129 uh, ounces uh, of silver to buy one ounce of gold, then obviously that's a, a historical mismatch. And, and you, you can play the mean reversion game, expecting the mean to come back down um, in terms of a, a relative valuation and you can make some money that way. Spot price closed uh, on Friday night, $25.34 US uh, dollars. Long-term guide, oh geez, you know, where, do, where do you go from there? For me, I think $50 easily based on some, uh, on the monetary side of things. If silver is going to continue to be a monetary metal and you look at the amount of uh, M2 that's been created, okay, new currency units, 
it, 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 by definition, if you've got a limited supply of something and you have an increase of something else, i.e. currency units, it's going to take more of those currency units to, to buy the same amount of fixed goods. In this case, if we're talking about silver bullion, that means the relief from that uh, mismatch in equilibrium has to shift to the right in terms of price, meaning price goes up. Now, depending on where you go with your, your gold pricing, I was reading a fantastic quarterly report by Go Rosen. If you don't read Go Rosen's reports, uh, I highly, highly recommend it. The fantastic commodity market uh, breakdown every quarter, and it's well worth the read. Uh, they expect by the end of this bull market, gold will get to somewhere around 15,000 US per ounce. And if you used a, um, a gold silver ratio, of $35 an ounce, that gets you somewhere to around $428 uh, per ounce of silver or something ridiculous. I don't know if that's going to happen, but I am comfortable saying that, you know, between 50 and $150, uh, I think is almost a shoe in but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's imminent, okay? So gold prices, um, I don't see how they can't get, uh, or how they can't stay below at least $3,000 an ounce um, over the next two to three years. And by the end of the decade, sure. I mean, these seemingly crazy numbers, like 10,000 an ounce, 15,000 an ounce. If you watch the gold video, you know how these uh, people come up with those numbers. If you're purely backing um, the supply unit of currencies by uh, a certain amount of gold, which is a historical way of, um, of backing the, mon the monetary supply, then you will find out what the implied price of gold is and then if you use the gold silver ratio you can have a good estimate as to what you think the silver price may be in a number of different scenarios okay so there there are a lot of moving parts it'll be how many currency units are created over the next decade the way we're going <laughs> will be like zimbabwe it'll be heaps and then we say okay well at what um, at what fixed units do we or reserve ratio do we have for gold units and then from there you'll say, okay, and then what will be the gold silver ratio? Okay, so it's quite tricky. There are a lot of moving parts, but you can come up with several different scenarios. You can create sensitivity tables to, to figure out where you think it might go. The question is, do we think it's gonna go lower than $25 per ounce? Maybe, I mean, who knows? It, it could happen. I think my average entry price personally is around about the $14, uh, $15 mark for the bullion, but I just, I would find that really, really unlikely. I find it very difficult to believe with the way um, governments around the world are behaving and the way the central banks are basically papering over their debts and monetizing their mistakes that with the fiat currency units being increased, I find it difficult to see how uh, base metals, monetary metals, precious metals decrease in price denominated by these new currency units. I, I just, yeah, it could happen, of course, but I don't think it's likely. All right, here we go. So silver price action over the last year. So we, silver has cooled off about 8%. Uh, went on a nice run in 2020, and now we're 8% um, below baseline. If you look at it uh, over the last 100 years or so, uh, ignore all everything to the left of um, this where my cursor is here. But the reason being before August 15, 1971, gold price was fixed. Yes, you had some adjustments after the uh, world wars, but um, that's nothing compared to once the, uh, the gold standard was ended and the Bretton Woods standard technically was ended. And so you had free floating currencies and gold and silver were no longer, um, or I should say the fiat currencies were no longer anchored to gold and silver and the monetary metals. So if we move forwards, you can see um, the price units and you've got a couple of spikes there. So this first spike is interesting, 1979, 1980, the Hunt brothers had the idea of the silver squeeze. They realized there was a heap of extra paper contracts, way more than actual physical bullion. They decided to buy up a heap of bullion, started to, to buy up long contracts and then demand uh, good for delivery. Okay, so bullion on delivery of the futures contracts. And so they drove the price up and then the COMEX changed the rules and said, uh, geez, we're in a bit of trouble here. So let's just settle for cash, okay? Then coming off, I think this is 2011, a big spike in silver prices due to the expected industrial demand and industrialization, urbanization of China. So there was a huge uh, materials bull market. And then here 
we are today, uh, looking forward to what most people believe, uh, what I believe is going to be a rebound, but we'll see. I'm not as uh, a crazy as some of the, the silver bugs out there that um, think it's going to, to four digits, but who knows? Depends on uh, the amount of currency creation. The gold-silver ratio. So this is another key ingredient that I was meant, uh, mentioning just before. If you look um, over the last 30 odd years, this is the the range in which the gold silver ratio generally trades. So it's a range bound metric. And so you can see down here, you would look at it saying silver is expensive and that matches up with 2011 when you saw that huge price spike. Because think about it, it takes less ounces now of silver to buy the same ounce of gold equivalent. Okay, and then if we look at the other end of the spectrum here in April, March uh, 2020, it got up to 129 um, ounces of silver needed to buy gold. So that suggests that on a relative basis, silver was very cheap because you had to, um, we had to pay over four times more in terms of ounce equivalents uh, for gold than you did back in 2011 when you used silver as the denominator, okay? So 35 through to 129, I would say, um, look, it's, it's, it is range bound and anywhere in that kind of 50 to 70 space seems to be the new norm. However, if you listen to guys like Eric Sprott, he absolutely expects that ratio to revert back to what over millennia has actually been um, the median price, uh, median ratio, I should say, which is more like 15 to 16 times. And geologists, uh, I guess, kind of back this up by saying that silver is found uh, it more in line with that ratio in the Earth's crust. So you've got one ounce of gold. You normally have, depending on who you listen to, 12 to 16 ounces of silver equivalent. So who knows? Impossible to get um, precisely correct. But if we come up with ranges and come up with some sensitivity, then I think any which way you dice it, silver prices are likely to go higher when denominated in fiat uh, dollars. Question now turns to, okay, should we buy the bullion or should we look at the miners? And one way that you can do it is look at the index divided by the commodity in question. So in this case, we're looking at silver miners, the, uh, the junior miners in this case, S-I-L-J is the index for um, a whole heap of silver junior miners and then the silver bullion itself okay so you're taking the index divided by the commodity and this gives you an idea as to whether or not the uh, the index is expensive relative to the commodity or cheap and so you will obviously divert more of your funds towards either the the producers or the physical metal itself depending on where that ratio trades so as you can see here it's looking like um, it's taking more uh, more silver units to buy the index than it has compared to even um, last month in October, where the silver juniors were just ridiculously um, ridiculously cheap. And so you can use this as a range bound tool. So as that silver uh, starts to rise, it's saying it's going to take more and more silver to buy the index, and therefore the index might appear to be cheap somewhere around about um, around about here and vice versa so the less amount of silver it takes to buy the index either silver bullion is expensive or the miners are cheap whichever way you want to to look at it okay price action over the last five years here's silver okay so uh, tracking the the bullion performance versus the miners okay and why is that so miners have costs Okay, they have operating costs and it takes a, a hell of a lot of uh, mining and um, geological and uh, managerial know-how to put a mine in place and to get it actually producing versus just the, the physical metal itself. But the miners, every now and then, once in the cycle, they have such leverage that as the commodity price starts to increase, people know that that's what these guys produce and sell. So you'll see massive multiples applied to the miners, okay, for each unit of cash flow that they produce. If costs remain relatively fixed, but their profit margins can start to skyrocket due to increased um, commodity prices. Okay, if we take a, a comparison year to date, we've got First Majestic, the purple line, uh, silver bullion, and um, uh, no, sorry, we're looking at um, two different 
two different silver equivalents there. That's my bad. There's silver crest, and then there's silver, and then there's Pan American silver, and Fortuna silver mines. Okay, so the yellow line will be the uh, bullion. The dark purple there is silver crest, which is the name of the silver um, producer, silver crest. As you can see, First Majestic seems to have uh, done the best out of the um, out of the producers there. Fortuna has literally dropped off a cliff overnight. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Funnily enough, I think Pan American is the, the highest quality out of them all, um, but we, we can talk about that at another day. It's about Fortuna. So if you're invested in the portfolio for a copier, um, I got some questions saying, gee, what happened to Fortuna? Um, 20% drop overnight. I mean, I woke up and I just was like, oh my God, hijo de puta, uh, or in Mexico, I guess we say, hijo de la chingadera. I was just like, what is going on? I can't believe it's actually happened. So let's break it down. Mexican government is essentially holding their permit hostage for their mine at San Jose in Mexico, okay? This should not really be a surprise to the company given that their permit ran out in October. However, and I questioned whether or not I should exit, but I was happier being in Mexico as opposed to Peru because Pedro Castillo in Peru is a um, full-blown socialist. And so, you know, it's the country's all going to go to hell. With regards to Fortuna, they had said they had been allowed to keep operating under the protection of Mexican courts. So I figured, and most investors figured, okay, well, that's great. And share price was going really well. I think we were up uh, about 15% on our position. Then all of a sudden, it seems that, you know, now they've got to enter into new negotiations in order to get their permit formally approved, which will allow them to operate this mine for another 10 years, okay? <laughs> you got to love uh, Gobierno Mexicano is, um, you know, it's one of those. It is what it is. Anyway, San Jose is a big, big, big deal, okay? This is their largest silver producing mine. If they lose that, it's disastrous, okay? They produced, their quarterly production numbers came out last week. And uh, to give you an idea, San Jose produced 1.4 million ounces for the quarter, okay? So the company simply cannot afford to lose, uh, you know, almost 6 million ounces for the year, okay? It's, it's, it's not good. So we're in the position, well, I'm in the position now where I've got a decision to make. When you're down greater than 20% on a position, you have two choices, okay? You, can, you buy more and stick with your thesis and enter into a lower average cost, or you cut the losses and roll that capital into another position. So I'm still tossing up which of those two I'm going to do. We cannot sit there and do nothing because we are gonna lose the time value of money. So I've got a decision to make. Okay, let's have a look. The decision that I have to make is around what will happen if they don't get their permit renewed, okay? And if that happens, we have to come up with a valuation for the company it's in San Jose mining, okay? So this is what I've done here. I've gone through the quarterly report, looked at the production numbers, and then come up with new numbers based on what would be the case if you didn't have, if you took out San Jose's numbers, okay? I've also changed the pricing of the bullion because if we're gonna be in mining, we're in it for the upside, okay? It's not a defensive play. We are taking um, a thesis that we believe that the metals are going to increase, the metals which they mine, and we're gonna have a look at, okay, what is a likely price, a bullish price, but not stupidly bullish? How much of the metals can they produce and what will their margins be in that case? And then what estimate of cash flows or, or EBITDA can we reasonably apply? So this would be, if you look at the consolidated company without San Jose, let's say they don't get the permit um, renewed, this is how much gold the company would produce uh, on an annualized basis using a price of 2,200. This is the, the total revenues from the gold production of the company. And this, you'll see the importance of San Jose here. So if we take the consolidated value of the ounces produced in silver and they lose production from San Jose, then we're left with, you know, <laughs> not much, okay? 270,000 ounces of silver, okay? At a $30 silver price, you know, that, that's just a huge hit. Look at how much, um, you, you'll have lost 201.6 million uh, 
dollars worth of revenue just from one mine, okay, which is not good. Total revenues will be for the new entity, 532 million, okay? At the the current EBITDA margin, I haven't allowed for an improvement in the margin, which is possibly a little harsh. Generally speaking, as the um, cash flows increase, you won't have to increase your cost to the same degree. So you could probably argue um, I could increase the margin. But anyway, here you've got 239.4 million um, in EBITDA, okay, divided by shares on issue. I've done the work for you. That implies a price five dollars and seventy six uh, per share. Okay, so we'd, there's still quite a bit of upside. So we have to look at it now and say, well, I have to, and say, okay, we take San Jose out of the picture. Uh, is there still upside for the company? And yes, there is. So I'm leaning towards leaning in and buying more. The problems for this company come around the fact that. Of course, all the other mines are not exactly risk-free either. You've got Lindero in Argentina. Um, people think the national sport of Argentina is playing soccer. It's not. It's stealing from investors. Okay, when it comes to mining, the you know the taxes that Argentina can put on some of these producers is insane. And then of course you've got uh, I think it's Cayamora in Peru, which I mean who knows what's going to happen there. It's it's a solid producer. It produced two hundred seventy-five thousand ounces of silver this quarter so if the taxes were start to go were start to be increased by the the socialist government there that would start to, to increase the bottom line so there's a heap of risk attached I have to uh, I think there's still value in the company the question is do I double down and get a lower entry price to get a higher upside sticking with the thesis and of course if San Jose permit does come through you know whether they pay bribes or do whatever the hell they could have to um, if that comes through, the, the price will skyrocket. It will be an absolute, you know, maybe a maybe a six bagger. Who knows? It'll definitely be a don't, well, not definitely, but if it, if it comes through, it's likely to be a four or five bagger in short time. It will absolutely skyrocket. So I've got to weigh up that risk reward versus if I just cut the position now and roll that into a, a bigger, more sturdy company such as Pan American. These are the decisions a fund manager has to make. So for Patrick's question with regards to First Majestic, what I've done is given a relative comparison. So you look at the market cap, it's about three times that of Fortuna. And the company's balance sheet is much better than Fortuna's also. So they've basically got, well, they've got a negative net debt, so they're not carrying any debt, and they've got less shares on issue, okay? Huge, huge fan of Keith Newmeyer, the CEO. He's a great promoter. And the question will come down to, price and valuation. So it's no question in my mind that First Majestic is a better company. They've got better sites, they've got a better promotional CEO, they've got um, so much going for them. The investors know that company. But of course, uh, this is where Charlie Munger talks about, everyone knows who the best horse in the race is, but when you start to add in the odds, the payoffs become trickier to calculate. Okay, so if it were a question of paying the same price of both companies, for me it's a no-brainer. I would go with First Majestic. However, let's take a look at the valuations. So you've got a market cap, the free cash flow of thirty-eight times, thirty-eight times for a silver producer. That is a huge, huge price that you're paying for those cash flows. You are betting that. A, silver prices are going a long way north of where they are, not just a little increase. B, that Newmar and the team can actually pull it off. Some of their exploration projects actually get to production, which is not a guarantee by any means. And that C, that they can keep the cost down to bring up D, the cash flows for which you're going to pay 38 times are going to reach a level that makes that economically viable for you to invest. Okay, so that's that's just a huge, huge price to pay. EBITDA, EBITDA it looks a little better there. Um, a PE 26 times, that's, I mean, that's cr pretty, uh, pretty rich for a, a mining company. And price to book, okay, the book value of the company, two and a half times. Fortuna obviously is a heap of rich a risk attached to the company. It's not as good a company. It won't produce as many ounces, uh, all other things being equal. However, you are paying a heap less. So the market cap to free cash flow is just over seven times. EV to EBITDA 3.5 times, that's dirt cheap. Dirt cheap for a, a company. PE is uh, less than 10 and their price to book is less than one. So you're paying less than the actual assets of the company, okay, or assets minus liabilities. 
If we look at First Majestic, so this is analyst projections for next year. Uh, it's not 2023, it's 2022's production. And I've applied not the same ridiculous multiples, but something that would be um, still ahead of the median for the industry. Uh, but if you think about it, like 20 times the free cash flow, you're getting a free cash flow yield of 5%. So you can buy a lot of tech companies uh, which f with far less risk that are going to pay you a better yield than 5%. Okay. So even though I've taken a heap off that 38 times multiple and brought it down to 20, 20 is still a lot to pay for a, a company with so much risk in such a capital intensive business. EBITDA per share and an EBITDA EBITDA of six, more in line with the median. We get a uh, price, implied price. And then if we get uh, the average of the two, it suggests a, a target price of about $18, which is about 30% on the upside. So not bad, but again, a lot of assumptions being made. Compare this to Fortuna. Here are the cash flows. Here's the EBITDA on a per share basis expected next year. So they're basically not pricing in um, San Jose. Free cash flow multiple, EB to EBITDA, it's increased from where it's currently trading. So I'm saying the market starts to value it a little more fairly and we get um, an equally weighted average price expected of $7.17, which is a 85% um, on the upside. So you can see we get almost triple the return potentially from Fortuna than we would with First Majestic, but there's a lot of uncertainty, okay? So what we do is say, how much of the uncertainty or how much of the risk has been priced in and is this a de-risked business i don't think fortuna will go bankrupt so let's take that i think we're, we're safe to say that that will be off the table they will probably be acquired by another big miner so maybe pan american or keith newmeyer come along and buy out the company and in those situations you would expect them to have to pay a premium and so we get a nice little um risk arbitrage premium there so although it's not as good a business it is a in my opinion at the moment it's a better investment opportunity when you compare um, some of the factors that we've considered thanks for watching i'm going to leave it there uh, got a new season of narcos to watch uh, <laughs> that's where i learned my spanish uh, thanks for watching if you haven't already liked and subscribed please do so leave a comment greatly appreciate uh, the chat that's going on on the uh, the comment section of youtube i've been asked to start a discord channel uh, maybe guys it's on the list okay i've got a lot of things to do uh, maybe i'll get there uh, but it's certainly a little bit lower down on the priorities if you haven't already liked and subscribed please do so. And if you're not following the uh, eToro portfolio, download the app, jump on there and um, either just add us to a watch list or if you're ready to go and you've got funds you want to invest, all you got to do is hit the copy button and away you go. Thanks for watching guys. As always, do your own due diligence. These are just my opinions and my ideas. This is what I'm doing with my personal money and the money that's been entrusted to me to manage. And so none of this is advice. I don't know your situation. You need to take that on board and you need to do your own due diligence to make your own decisions. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you in another video.